All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Side Talk. Tonight, I have Eleanor Vale. She's an author and a communicator on senior life. Welcome to the show, Eleanor. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Keisha. I'm delighted. Yes, I'm so excited to talk to you. So, um, guys, I know you're like wondering, oh, why are you doing a show on senior life, right? You're not a senior. No, I'm not. But I have a mother and my mom's single. And I wanted to get some advice from Eleanor and just find out what's in store in the future. You know, you never know where life is going to take you. And I think this is an amazing topic and great information for anyone who has parents out there that are of a certain age and hopefully will live to be a certain age. And like I said, you never know what turns life can take. So the more we know, the better off we are. So Eleanor, you were a lawyer for many years, and I wanted to ask you, did you enjoy that career? And was that something that you feel was really um, a calling for you? Um, I, I was a lawyer. I still am a lawyer, uh, uh, Keisha, and that's part of my um, talk with you tonight. I'm still practicing. In fact, I worked all day on a guardianship matter and I take it seriously. I love helping people, but I did put on a new career. I morphed into a senior commentator. I think I'm going to change my name a little bit to senior influencer because I'm getting a lot of emails, not only from folks in my age group, 65 and up, but folks in your age group um, asking what to do with their parent who's dating. Exactly. Yes. And that's exactly why I thought this would be great for the podcast. So, um, the first question I want to ask you is what age are you considered a senior? That's a wonderful question because I don't think I consider myself a senior yet. <laughs> Although we will talk a little bit about chronology. Chronology, I would think, is 60, 65, because the government tells us that, Keisha. You know, we we start getting our retirement, we get Medicare. That's why my book has Medicare in it. Uh, the government, Social Security. Um, we start taking money out and we start getting letters about uh, AIDS when you fall down. So 65, even 55, but I didn't like the age of 55. And if you let me go into that, I'd like to explain that. Yes, tell us. Well, 55, <clears throat> excuse me, 55, sometimes your kids are still at home. They're still living with you uh, because you're a young parent. And um, you're also, for women, probably still in menopause. You're just coming into menopause, really. You're still really, in some degree, a child in a childbearing age. So I felt that it was a different world. 65, your kids are out of the house, pretty much, and they have their own lives. They're in their 30s and 40s. Uh, and um, so that's why I felt 60, 65 was the better age to consider myself a senior. And chronology is strange and the doctors have divided age, old age into seniors into three categories, early old age, middle old age and old old age. So we're beginning to um, subdivide our senior years. Yeah, I feel like too, um, that the 40s and 50s and 60s that you see nowadays aren't the old, you know, 50s and 60s of the older days, you know, like today, when you see someone at a certain age, it's like, wow, you look amazing. Like people are looking a lot younger and doing a lot more, even well into their 60s, 70s. You know, I had an accountant that at 80 years old, he was still doing taxes and some other business ventures and things like that. He stayed very active. So I also think that that's um, the new norm, you know? 
I, I do start a chapter in my book saying, good news, honey, 80 is the new 60. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. There's anti-aging now. You know, uh, even men are, uh, and women, we're not, a, we're not ashamed of admitting whether we've had a facelift or not, or whether we've been to a dermatologist or not, or whether the men have had um, sexual aids put into their body uh, men are much more um, open about it. I really talk about that in my book. It's 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 an interesting book, and I and I know this is not a book show, but it's it's um it explains the world of older people, and it and it and it's, it explains what's going on in a very nice way because it was my journey when my husband died. And I started redating, and then I ended up uh, interviewing more than a hundred folks over sixty-five. I, I interviewed a man who got my, married at ninety-two. Wow! And I asked him, kidding, I said, "Well, what made you marry her?" He said, "She cried so much that to marry her, I finally gave in. She got and she got me drunk, and he was kidding around, but but he he tied the knot at ninety-two. That's pretty amazing. So you look amazing. Would you mind sharing your age with us? I'm 83. You look so good, <laughs> like unreal. And you were working all day today as an attorney. And now you're doing a podcast at night. God bless you. <laughs> I think work keeps us young. Yes, absolutely. So um, I, I was going to say, uh, what part... Um, what brought you on this journey to being the communicator on senior life? And you kind of touched on it a little bit when you said your husband passed away and that kind of catapulted you into the dating scene again. So you started dating and then did you just um, become very interested in finding out what other people were doing? And like, how did you become like the source I have to sort of correct you a bit. It wasn't easy. When my husband died, I was 74. And I was fine, I thought, because I had my, my practice, my children, my grandchildren, my friends, my clubs. I had a big social life, and I, I still do. But it was that Saturday night that I sat home alone or with a girlfriend that didn't work for me. On Saturday night, I needed someone I was chemically attracted to. And that goes from male, female, male, male, female, female. <clears throat> There's that chemical attraction, sexual attraction that uh, uh, we have for one person. It's not our mother, our father, or our sister, or brother. It's a, just a different place in our heart. So I wanted to date again. And I must tell you, I had a lot of fear and trepidation about it. It wasn't easy. Oh, of course not. I don't think it was. And, and if I, if it came off like that, I know that that wasn't something like your husband died and you were dating the next week. <laughs> Absolutely not. So forgive me if it came off like that, but once you, that you, that, that was like the journey because now that part of your life was kind of over with your husband being there. So now you have your friends, you have everything else, but then you realize that Saturday nights, you're home alone, and there's no um, companionship in your life. So you you go, you start to date. What was the first thing that you did to kind of put yourself out there once you became comfortable with the idea of even putting yourself out there? Well, I, I was fortunate in the sense that I had friends and a wide network of friends who, uh, and a few of them called me and said they knew someone they'd like to give my number to. So my first, and actually I, I, my first chapter of my book is par parachuting back in. Hey, that's because that's how I felt. But uh, it was about three months after my husband passed away and a friend of mine said to me, she wanted me to meet someone, was I ready? So I said, I didn't know. And I called my two sons who were in their forties at the time. And I said to them, Marilyn, I call her Nancy in the book, but Marilyn wants to get me a blind date. Do you think I should start dating again? 
And my one son, the one said, said, sure, mom. And the other one said, great. I don't know why I had to ask my kids permission, but I was fearful. And I guess I needed their support that they wouldn't say, are you crazy, mom? Or whatever they would say. And to show my stress about it, um, I was preparing for my blind date and I, and I started taking clothes out of my wardrobe, my closet. And I started looking like, what is a woman who's old, old? You know, I was in my seventies, a grandmother wear on a first date. And by the time I looked around, I had my whole closet on my bed. It looked like a war zone. I don't remember what I, I said, this looks like a teenager on her first date. And that's when I realized I was, I was catapulting back into something that I wasn't expecting or didn't know what was going to happen. I had sort of been there before, but it was a different age. And um, that's how I, I, I re-entered. I parachuted back in. Wow. So at, at 70, is sex still a desire? Is that something that you think about that you worry about? Like, oh my God, I'm going on this first date. Like if it leads to a second date and a third date, is there going to be sex? Like, what am I going to do? Is, you know, do you have all of those thoughts or is it like, ah, I'm not having sex. Like that's not happening. Great question, Keisha, about my feelings about sex. Yeah. I was very worried and nervous. Um, my sex with my husband was very routine and boring. I mean, that be honest, and not very often. And I didn't think I was interested, but I wanted to feel sexual. I wanted to be feminine. I, I had all my clothes out. I wanted to be pretty, even though whatever I was, I was. And when I met a man um, that I liked, I felt the urge. And I, I remember the first time he start, he kissed me goodnight, um, I started giggling. And, uh, and uh, I went, oh, and he, well, he sort of put his, this was at my apartment and he sort of put his tongue in my mouth. It was after the third date or second date. And I went, ooh, and I, and I felt giggly and he liked it. Uh, he, had, he was a widower, he was actually 80, but he got such a kick out of me being fresh. And we ended up actually getting engaged and almost getting married, and which is part of my story and why I wrote the book, if you want me to go continue. But my, my uh, interest in sex became novel. You know, if you remember the first time you touched someone you were sexually attracted to or he touched you, uh, there's nothing like that first touch. There's nothing like your first love. There's nothing like your first sexual contact. It just feels different. Well, after 44 years of marriage with one man, um, I felt the same thing. I felt a, a, a novelty. It was, it was invigorating and empowering and fun. Yeah, I can just imagine. I know that feeling. <laughs> it got to be an issue, you know, later on, and you really have to just, you have to work on it because I'm not as limber in bed as I used to be. And men have sexual issues, but I think we enjoy it. We enjoy it as much as you kids maybe more because we don't have to worry about kids entering the room. We don't have to worry about our periods coming. We don't have to worry about getting pregnant. Mm -hmm. All of that fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a, it, it really does keep you back. Um, the reason uh, I, I wrote the book though, is that this gentleman who um, I was in love with and he was very much like my husband and I was planning to, and he proposed and we were supposed to get married and his kids who loved meeting me, they said, oh, I was so much like his, um, their mother and I was included in all the events, suddenly took a different turn when they saw that we were planning to remarry in the church and a, a religious ceremony and really, you know, commit, they 
felt their dad shouldn't do it. Hmm. That's yeah. interesting. So before you go any further, um, Eleanor wrote a book. It's called Secrets of Dating and Mating After Medicare. So I was going to ask, you know, what made you feel confident enough to write a book and, um, you know, advise people in your book and what led to that? So you've already started with the story. So finish. Tell us, you know, what happened with um, this person you were going to marry and then also go into what made you feel confident enough to share your stories, um, your personal stories with others, hoping that, you know, they would learn something. Well, what happened was when, uh, when we broke up, I, he, he wanted, he, I, I call him, I call him, I think Fred Edward in the book, when he just, when he followed his kid's advice, and wanted to keep the relationship as it was, with you know, being true to each other and being bonded without living together in marriage. I broke up with him because I only knew marriage, and I gave him back his ring, and I became very, I got very depressed, and I started telling people about how devastated I was being jilted at the altar. Literally, we had wedding plans that I was jilted at the altar, altar at 76 years old. I said, what kind of sh is this? Yeah. And that's an oh hell no moment. That's right. Oh, hell, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I was telling a bartender where I had gone with my husband often and he said, you're alone. And I said, my husband's dead and now I'm depressed. But, but he said, there are a lot of people around this bar who come here at night, who have stories they can share, who are older, like you. And I said, okay, here's my card. And I gave him my law card. That was my business card. And sure enough, two or three men called me and wanted to talk about, I think they also may have wanted to date me. I don't know. But they also wanted to talk about my book. And I found that I started interviewing them and taking notes and I met with them and I started my book. It, and the subtitle of it is A Journey into the Incredible World of Dating, of lo dating Loving and Marrying After, after 60, of, of Singles Over 60. Um, so it was, it was my journey, my, my stories in there, how I was jilted. I met someone else that's to be continued and their stories too. So it's full of vignettes and the reviews of it were like great stories. I learned a lot. She takes me into the world. And then I, uh, I was asked to speak at a club and in front of a couple of organizations and then suddenly I found that I had morphed into a, a senior commentator. Wow, that is so fabulous. I love that because it really happened organically and, you know, it's from your life experience. So I, I love that. So why do you think so many seniors are afraid to date after divorce or becoming a widow? Because they have conceptions that are, some of them are valid, but they, sh they shouldn't override uh, their, um, their feelings. They should follow their feelings. If they want to meet someone, I've had people say to me, uh, particularly women, they only want younger women. Any, any guy I would want doesn't want someone like me. They only want younger women and, uh, and or the guys out there are, are losers. That's not true. You know, when I interviewed men, 99% of them said they wanted women within their own age group within 10 years of them because they didn't feel comfortable with women who were younger. They said they were too high maintenance or they had too much energy. But uh, uh, yeah, we're talking about maybe some very wealthy guys who are male celebrities who want a hottie on their hand. But the average guy, which is 99% of them, really want a woman they can relate to and feel good about and hug and kiss and, and not be intimidated by or even show off. 
older folks don't even have that much energy to want to go out to show off. So if the women really read that and, and hear it enough, they'll, they'll be encouraged to be who they are. Um, it's true we should you know, present ourselves as well as we can, even if it's physical enhancements as men do, but still be who we are because there is a man out there for us or there is somebody out there for us. I ended up after I was jilted by my guy who I really, really thought I was remarrying and was going to be married to, I went on the internet and I met the, the gentleman who's uh, on the cover of my book. I'm going to hold up the cover because he's a cutie. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I have a, 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 pic, a picture of it there. Anyway. Yeah, here he is. The, the guy on the cover is my boy toy. He's a few years younger than I am. And here I am. Uh, these are candid pictures, holding a glass of wine, because I thought, and I met him on the internet, and his story's in there too. Wow. I, inter I interviewed him, but I, I was actually wanted to date him because I met him on the internet. And uh, But other guys who I met on the internet who I was dating, I interviewed and they were in the book, but he, we stuck, now we're together seven years. Wow, that's beautiful. Congratulations. Yeah, and you know something, Keisha? I am 83, I said that before. I have never been happier than I am today. That's beautiful, I love it. So what are some tips that you would give um, for people getting back in the dating game that are, you know, seniors? Don't be afraid of the internet. Do talk to people who you know and ask if they know anybody. Um, be careful about the internet. You know, don't do anything stupid, but definitely use it. Go to meetups. Whatever you've been doing with your life, do it, you know, as a single person. Don't be afraid of life. And uh, don't be afraid of your frailties. Uh, if you had an operation, fine. If you're on medication, fine. I have stories in the book about a woman on a walker and she met someone also on a walker and they're a couple. They are a couple, you know, you're going, every pot has a cover. So if you actually allow yourself to expose yourself a little bit, to expose yourself, you're going to meet someone. Nice. Uh, some tips that I can give you at girl to girl, mm -hmm. wear your hair longer. A lot of older women cut their hair short. And men, really, they don't see the wrinkles. They don't see, um, they, they, they see our physical attributes um, that we have, and they see hair. Uh, and um, men as a whole, whether they admit it or understand it or not, like longer hair, shoulder length or so. Uh, but so many older women cut their hair so short, I don't know why. I honestly don't know why. Yeah, I think they just think, oh, I'm getting older. It's time to cut my hair. I agree. You know, if you have it and it's there and it looks good, you know, keep it. <laughs> or wear a fall or wear, I mean, wear a wig. I have friends who wear wigs. All right. The time. Or we extensions. Wear, I right? used to wear a fall all the time as, as a young person for the hell of it. Mm -hmm. Why not now? Why not? So how do you keep your kids out of your business? Just like what happened with the other guy that you were dating and his kids got involved. Like what, what advice would you give to people about, you know, letting your kids know, hey, mom's okay, but I'm grown. There it is a problem. It is an issue. And I think when an older parent, uh, when a parent in 60s, 70s, 80s, wants to date or is dating, he, he or she has to be aware that his kids are now the new in-laws or the new parents. That's the title of my chapter. Kid, your ki kids are the new in-laws because they have something to say. They really do. Um, they really do about the fact you may have some money uh, and, uh, or you may have some possessions they want. 
they don't want you giving it away when you're 60 and you might die soon and they've been wanting it all their lives. Uh, they may just feel you're not mentally competent to, to handle. So you have to be prepared. Now, there are two things I want, want you to, you have to listen to your kids because the comments they make may be true. You may be suckered and you may be suckered with someone who uh, is going to be taking advantage of you. So your kids are looking out for your best interest down deep. They really are. So you really have to listen and make sure that what they're saying is not true or that you can live with it. In other, uh, in other words, understand the criticism. After that, after that, you simply say to them, I love you dearly. Uh, I am going to do what I'm going to do. Um, my two sons were not surprised that I started dating so quickly, which surprised me, frankly, because I know they know I had a good relationship with their dad. Um, and they don't tell me that much about the relationship. They, the, the man I'm, I'm with now, Don, um, they had a little bit more trouble adjusting to than Ernest because Don is a more alpha male. He's more uh, into himself and he's more com comments more. He has more to say about things about them, about me. And they're not, you know, they, they sort of sat back and kind of like took it in like, what's that? But uh, they they respect my wishes and they 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 wish me well, um, and they've learned to live with it. They've learned to live with it. Um, I'm I'm strong about it, and they see that I'm not doing anything uh, hurting myself. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, as long as you're happy and you're with someone that's not, you know, abusing you or taking you down some crazy road. I think that, you know, it is, it should be your decision. But also that I'm not forgetting them. Right. That I have not, no, I still see my children over Christmas. I don't take him anymore because he has to see his children mm -hmm. over Christmas. And we, and Thanksgiving, I spend with my kids, he spends with his kids. This year, we did combine it a bit, but, it, it, but we don't worry about it. We, we find our own way to, to share Christmas presents and, Valentine's Day is ours. So we have our holidays and we don't carry on uh, with, with the various families. You have to, I, I think I, I'm going to say to relax and go with the flow and you'll find yourself in a good relationship and happier for it. So at this age, living together and living together versus not living together versus getting married versus not. Are those things such a big thing as when you're younger or is it now just like, I'm set in my ways, I'm gonna live in my house and you live at your house and then we'll come together and hang out. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll talk about the interviews. Most of the interviewees did not want to get remarried. And some of them did not move in with each other. And some of them even had a more distant relationship, which I wouldn't call a relationship, but they did because it was enough for them. So my last chapter is called 50 Shades of Relationships. Because if they called it a relationship and they felt bonded, they were, and they were happy. Uh, I personally do not want to get remarried. Now, it's odd that when I first met my first guy, Edward, I wanted to get married. And when he said, no, let's keep it the way it is and not get married, I broke up. I was insulted. I was devastated. He didn't want me enough or love me enough. He just wanted me handy. Um, but now I, I don't want to marry Don, uh, my boy toy. We have a very good relationship, but I like my privacy sometimes. And I think he does too. Uh, we, we really haven't talked about it, but I just know that we, we would get along, but it would be tougher and we're fine now. We're just fine. I don't know what's gonna happen if he gets sick or if I get sick. 
whether he would move in with me or I move in with him to take care. Can't worry about it. Cannot worry about it. He takes care of me now to the extent that I need it. And I take care of him now to the extent he needs it. He'll go to the doctor with me. I'll go to the doctor with him. But as far as taking care of each other in a real uh, heavy way, which you would expect from a marriage, I just don't know. Hmm. So my advice is go with the flow. Don't, I would say, don't think about getting married. Yeah. So how can you make a real connection after 70? Like, what are some ways that, you know, you can really connect and have a lasting relationship? Number one, be prepared for a long term time for a year or so, not before you sleep with each other that can come fairly quickly. But before you feel bonded or want to feel bonded, even though it, you know, when you're younger, you take chances, you, you know, you may want to live together or procreate or have kids, or you want to cement it when you're older, you're more set in your ways and it takes longer. So don't worry if you're dating someone for seven, eight, nine months and nothing's going on except you're having a good time. So that's that. I don't know if that quite answers your question. Yeah, I love that answer because that's good because some people might feel like, oh, I've been dating this guy and I'm having a really good time, but I don't, it's, I don't feel like, you know, there's a connection or there's some deepness to it. So I think that's really good advice because it might take a little bit longer, you know? When you're younger, I think you get stressed more about it. What I'm trying to tell older people and explain to you that when you're older, you don't, you shouldn't stress as much about, oh, is he dating other people? Or is he seeing people? What is he doing? Screw it, screw it. You're in your skin, you're having a good time. He's not taking anything uh, except some oxygen sometimes from you and giving you enough, let it happen, don't push. And um, that's what is, that's what people said in the book as well that uh, they, they fall in love afterward. At, they actually don't know when they fall in love. It, it just sort of comes. Right, naturally happens. So what is your advice for protecting yourself when you do have money? Well, they're my lawyer, the lawyer. <laughs> yeah, you put on your lawyer hat. Yeah, well, my lawyer hat says you sign prenuptials or postnuptials. Uh, um, and there's all sorts of advice, but I'll tell you honestly, Keisha, that partially broke up my relationship with my first guy, because when we were supposed to get married, his kids and my kid, my kids know so much, but his kids said, you need a prenuptial. And then I hired a lawyer, he hired a lawyer, and we started arguing through the lawyers about what would be covered in the prenuptial. And that was one of the reasons that we broke up. Mm. So I, if you're in your six, if you're in your sixties, I'm not so sure I would recommend a prenuptial in your seventies and eighties, definitely. In your sixties, you know, you have 30 years ahead of you. That's a long time to stay in a relationship, but you should protect your money. I tend to leave 99, I, I tend to leave everything to my kids. And I put it in trust, they, they owe trust. Yeah. So I, so I don't have, and I'm not getting married. So I don't have to worry about a prenuptial or a nuptial. And he has, he has a lot of money. He has money um, and he's leaving it for his kids and we're fine. I mean, I don't need his money and he doesn't need mine. Right. So um, I'm going to play a game with you. This game is called Oh Hell No, Oh Hell Yes, right? So I'm going to say some things to you and you tell me if it's an Oh Hell No or if it's an Oh Hell Yes, or in some cases, sometimes it's an Oh Hell Maybe, okay? Okay. So splitting the bill on the first date, is that an Oh Hell No, Oh Hell Yes, or an Oh Hell Maybe? Oh Hell Maybe. Why would you say that? It depends. It depends on how it starts. If it's a big dinner, uh, you offer to pay the bill. You don't, ins- you don't, um, you offer to split the bill. You don't pay it. Um, 
or you offer to, yeah. It, it, uh, and when, when I met um, Don, my, my guy now, actually he lives in Westchester and we decided to meet and I didn't want to meet at his house. And he doesn't, and I didn't want him in New York. He didn't want to come to New York. So I actually invited him to my club for a drink as a first date. And that was meant that I paid for it, but I felt more relaxed and more comfortable in control. Mm. Okay. All right. Sex on the first date. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell maybe. Oh, hell no. <laughs> you don't want to get a bad reputation. <laughs> Correct. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Dating an older man who has young children. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell maybe. Oh, hell no. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. Oh, God. At that stage of life. That's one of the beauties of dating when you're older. Yeah, but you know how some older guys hook up with a younger girl that might have some ulterior motives and then they have a baby and then maybe they break up, but now he's stuck with like a seven year old and he's like 70, you know? Right. So well, the, men, the men I interviewed were nervous about that. That's why they liked older women. Yeah. I mean, they it happens. Families. Yeah. Uh, yes. There are men who get ho ho or who are hooked up with the, especially if they have money. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. And so the, the, the younger women uh, do have a child, which they love, and uh, the guy is stuck with, the, and they, they, the women don't really care about the marriage. Yeah, exactly. Men, men, are, men, men are aware of that. Yeah. Dating someone who lives at home with his children. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. Oh, hell maybe. Oh, hell no. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that before, but it's, oh, hell no. He'd have to be willing to move out. Yeah, because that, you could see how that could be mm, uncomfortable, right? Uh, I'm not a stepmother at, anymore. I'm too old to be a stepmother because older folks don't need me. And I, I'm not interested in group, group sex or something. <laughs> right. We're talking about people in their 30s and 40s. Yeah. Dating someone who tells you during courtship that what's his is his and what's yours is yours. Like you're just on a date and he's like telling you, you know, my things are my things. And, I, uh, you know, I'm never breaking any of my stuff for anybody or, you know, he just has that type of attitude. Is that an oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. Or oh, hell maybe. Oh, hell Maybe. Um, I think people say things, I think you have to look at their conduct. I think you have to see what they actually do. I think sometimes when people say things, they're being defensive rather than being uh, honest. He might be very generous and, and might be afraid to share because it may be a commitment. So you have to watch him. You have to watch him. Like my my guy, I mean, he really talks cheap. Mm. He comes from a, a poor family. He worked himself up and he he holds on to it. But he's turned and, and he was, I could feel he was very frugal. He's not cheap. He's frugal. And yeah. there's a difference. Being frugal doesn't hurt me. Being cheap would hurt me. Yeah, absolutely. So he's, I, yeah, you, you get the difference. Yes, surely do. Um, all right. So that was my, oh, hell no. Oh, hell yes. So I'm going to ask you to share with us your worst dating experience as a senior and your best. I repressed anything bad. I, re I think it's only the fear of having a bad experience with a stranger that I can talk about because um, I simply didn't have really a bad experience. Yes, I, I, I met someone on the internet who looked totally different from his picture on the dating site. And I was like in a state of shock. And I said, how do I get out of here? <laughs> right. Something like that is what I mean. <laughs> like, yeah. I was at a public place. 
I had my drink. I wrote up, I wrote him up saying, you know, and he was very hypercritical and, you know, he was just disgusting to be with, but it was a short time. And I, and I understood where he was coming from and that was it. Yeah. That was my, probably my worst experience that I remember. Okay. And the best is your boy toy. Well, the first single experience, just meeting someone, I have to say my boy toy, because when he first invited me to his house, I only went up in the afternoon uh, because I was interviewing him. You know, I dated him and then I dated him again and then I interviewed him and then we went back to dating. It was kind of odd, but that's the way it worked. But I interviewed him and he was sitting on his porch petting a cat. And there was something very sweet about his sitting there and talking about how his wife, he, he was actually divorced and how he got divorced after 44 years of marriage. And, and he was talking about how he felt like raw meat and how he was meeting women, but he was petting the cat in such a sweet way. I found that really sweet. And I, I, I kind of felt myself warming up to him. Nice. So how can people figure out what to do with the next 25 years of their life once they get to this seniorville and they start thinking about, well, what am I going to do? How do I date? How do I make myself happy? What advice can you give them for figuring these things out? Talk to people, be honest with themselves, read books, um, keep moving, develop a passion, feel alive. If you feel alive in yourself, you're going to bring that life to someone else. And someone else is going to love your liveliness. Yes. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this conversation. Please tell us where we can purchase your book and keep up with all of the senior things that you have going on. My book is on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and, and it's on a lot of uh, um, stores, uh, Hudson Booksellers. It was in Walmart. I don't know. They stopped advertising it, but it's been around. Um, I would love folks to read the reviews on Amazon if they just to read the reviews and see whether they want to buy the book. As a result of my book, though, I did start a website. And the title of the website is resetmyclock.com. And it's for folks who are over 60 who want to come to the, the mission statement is where seniors come to get back in the game of life. And it's a community of folks who are sharing tips on travel, tips on meeting each other, tips on health. Um, um, as older folks. So I think that would be something for folks to, to look into. Definitely. I will definitely be sending my mom this website. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eleanor. Thank you, Keisha. And keep up the good work. It's a lovely show. You're lovely. And it was delightful to be with you today. Oh, I appreciate you. <laughs>